Um, so yeah, what I want to do is, um, like Ali, to explore and ultimately to reject the proposition built into the session that there's a fundamental difference of concern between approaches to archaeology that stress um, specific historical situations and putting very precise chronologies um, to those situations and archaeology that focuses on relationality as a condition of existence in the past. Um, the direction I want to take this is by considering what biographical research might look like within a relational framework. Um, and I'll give examples from my PhD research on the biographies of houses at Chattel Hoyuk, um, specifically focusing on hearth and oven areas. Um, and I'll suggest that biographical research in a relational framework, specifically talking about participatory relations between scales so in, in the sense of Manuel de Landa, uh, gives us a way of doing archaeology in which the concerns of historicizing research and relational archaeology dovetail quite nicely, actually. So the problem, as I understand it, um, for people of a historicizing bent with relational archaeology is especially acute when it looks something like this. Uh, this is a tangogram from Hodder's 2012 volume. Um, and what the diagram attempts to do is to map out, um, I'm sorry, it's not terribly legible there, but it tries to map out the um, different dependencies, contingencies of material on one another in the world of Çatalhöyük early in the seventh millennium in central Turkey. Um, and it does capture, to some extent, the intensity of, of dependency that existed among things. Um, the problem with it is kind of captured in, in the subtitle of uh, the image, um, entanglement theme early, it says. Uh, the implication is if we were to do history in this manner, um, we might end up doing entanglement theme early and explore those connections. Entanglement theme, middle seventh millennium, explore those connections. Entanglement theme, late, and so on and so forth. Our history ends up looking a little bit something like this. Um, this is a bit like a lasagna. It's uh, got really great detail and, and structure horizontally within these envelopes of contemporaneity here, but the vertical structure, the interstices, are really a bit mushy. Um, and so as Alistair and Alex and colleagues have set out in a couple of recent papers, um, we can see a difference between this particular relational approach to archaeology and a historicizing approach, one focused on generalizable relations within kind of assumed envelopes of contemporaneity, um, and one that tries to really specifically demonstrate contemporaneity through Bayesian chronology um, and emphasize very particular historical situations that aren't repeated or generalizable in the same way. Um, this is an interesting way of framing the debate. Um, and, and there's certainly some punches land home on hotter and, and relational approaches in general. Um, but as I said, like Ali, I want to argue that we can actually work with both of these sets of concerns and in bringing them together, do something um, really more robust than either one done on its own. Um, so I come from a background in object bio biographical research in archaeology, um, which traditionally means something like this, following the Padurai and Kapitav um, example, the social lives of things. Um, so we start by analytically centering an object, uh, some artifact from a museum or excavation context, um, and we focus in on a series of transformative interactions that that object had with humans. Uh, Gosden and Marshall put it very nicely. We look at how the biographies of human beings and the biographies of objects intertwine over time in this way. If we were to do this with one of my Chattel Hayek house um, kitchens, we, we could nicely line up building construction, initial floor formation, the design process that goes into that, a series of feature modifications, um, some special ritual depositions. We find caches of obsidian, ochre, um, sometimes uh, dead infants around ovens, um, and then the sometimes very elaborate closure practices that go on at Chattel Hoyek. This house in particular was 
um, burned quite dramatically um, at the end of its life, um, and then rebuilt on the same floor, same kind of house plan, using the walls as, as foundations for a house completely superimposed above it. Um, and this ties into, um, in a traditional approach, uh, different kinds of events tend to tie into different interpretive angles on human existence as well, and I've sketched these out below the biography there. A relational biography looks a little bit different. Um, in, in large part, we don't assume from the beginning that the artifact we have is a self-evident bounded object. It's a fragment of archaeological matter. Um, in the past, it was construed as an object only at, by participating in a number of larger scale relations or assemblages. Um, so our house floor participated at any one given moment in a number of assemblages. And the development of a human body, we've got fingerprints in the plaster here, um, in task scapes, routines, in, in the floor plan of a house as, as a larger functioning entity, um, in the type of space that was a kitchen, um, and in larger neighborhoods in the site itself. Um, its nature as an object emerges in its participation in these different kinds of entities. So by participating in, in all of these things, the material fragment that we're analytically centering is <coughs> opened up to be pushed and pulled on, to have demands made of it by its participation in, in different assemblages. It has to fit into the taskscape, fit into neighborhood politics and whatnot. This process um, becomes sedimented into the material of the object itself. It, is the medium through which things like human lives and large political events are reconciled with each other on the ground in specific situations. <coughs> Doing relations biographically gives us a little bit of a better way to think about change in a relational setting. Um, I think the harder should, there it is. Um, so when we think of a fragment moving through different assemblages being pushed and pulled between a number of different assemblages at once, um, that's sedimenting not just the nature of, of this stuff at this moment, but building in a trajectory, a, a momentum towards difference um, into the physical structure of the social world. Um, I've got time, so an offhand example, um, uh, the best one I can think of is I'm a PhD student. I'm a certain assemblage of skills, knowledge, a body, books, laptops, and whatnot. I'm not supposed to be the same sort of assemblage five years from now that I am now. I'm embedded into who I am now is this momentum towards becoming different in a specific way. And this starts to give us, um, by doing biographical research, a way of putting some vertical structure on these entanglements. The example of a PhD student as a type of biography with momentum um, also hits at something else that's important. The fact that biographies can form types, biographical trajectories can form types. Um, other students in the room are in the same boat that I'm in. And that lets us go from types as something static, um, like a kitchen as a type of space, um, to types of trajectory, types of transformation over time, um, narratives, as it were, that play out, or trajectories that play out repeatedly um, in different situations as a result of different fragments of matter participating in, in similar sets of relations. Um, so what I've done here is mapped out in stratigraphic order um, flotation samples from house floors at Chattelhayek. Um, these bars represent the density of bone and stone residues that have been trampled in or plastered into kitchen floors over time, starting with the earliest surfaces and ending with the latest ones. And when you do this, um, there's a very nice recurring pattern where, excuse me, um, 
the early house floors um, have highly variable but generally quite dense collections of bone and stone residues in them. And then later in the house's life, there will be a period where it's much sparser in residues and much more consistently surfaced. Um, this is a trajectory that plays out. Um, Alex can tell you better than I can how long these houses are occupied for, but um, actually looking slightly longer than a human life, but it's a repeated trajectory that's played out time and time again. These buildings are not all contemporarily occupied. Um, there is something about the larger scale relations that are pushing and pulling on a Chattahoya kitchen um, that causes them to develop in, along similar trajectories very often, at least in the early and middle seventh millennium. And that starts to get us thinking about what's a typical trajectory, what's normal um, as something that has a social reality to it. I'm drawing on, on work by Chris Fowler, um, Andy Jones, and others in saying that. Um, it also lets us start thinking about rupture, discontinuity, unusual circumstances. Um, so here's a Chattel Hayek building that's a little bit different. It's building 64. Um, in, in its earliest iteration, it's not terribly different from other buildings. As you can see in the top left, you have the hearth set off into kind of a side space. It's got platforms around the periphery of the house, a couple of side spaces um, for storage and whatnot. It's not terribly unusual for a Chattel Hayek house in its earliest years. Then things go differently. The hearth is closed. A big pit is dug through half of it, um, and a deposit of animal bone and ash um, is made there. The house may be abandoned for a little while, um, and then is reoccupied, refloored without a hearth or oven um, in the kitchen area, or former kitchen area, I suppose. Um, it's then partially demolished. Um, an arm and a leg are deposited in the rubble in the kitchen area, um, and then the house is really obliterated by this pit digging activity um, that erases half of the structure. And Building 64 is not alone in, in diverging from the normal trajectory for a Chattel Hayek house in, in this way. Its neighbors are also abandoned, strangely being uh, abandoned, left to rot, um, filled with midden, used um, for purposes other than occupation. And this can start to get us thinking about historical events um, and, and start to provide a framework in which we can not just seek out finer chronologies, but really make sense of them in terms of um, their implications for human lives and, and for history at bigger scales than human lives as well. Um, it would be really great to know, I can't say at the moment, whether all of these buildings in, whether all of these buildings were abandoned strangely at the same time, whether this is an event at a, in a very narrow time affecting a large space, or whether this is something that plays out over a large time affecting each small space individually. Um, by getting finer chronology, better Bayesian dates out of this, we can start to look at this. What kind of event is this? What um, Are these biographies all very closely tied together in this neighborhood? Or how are they closely tied together? Um, but that's interesting to us because of their relations, because of the fact that these biographies are centers where human lives, political systems, um, the larger landscape are tied together, are reconciled, and can push and pull on each other through common material. Um, I think it'll be under time, in fact. Um, and one final point to make is that um, I've drawn the assemblages that these houses are participating in as boxes here, but in fact, those are also um, relational biographies playing out. Um, at other scales, larger, smaller, intersecting with one another, interweaving. So biographical research, I focused on houses. Um, but by putting the best chronology we can and, and the best relational understanding we can to houses, to human bodies, to artifacts, um, to entire sites and landscapes, um, 
from very small moments up to very grand scales, um, we can take both the concerns of historicizing research and the concerns of relational research in archaeology and really bring them into play together um, in a bit better way. Peace.